first I want to introduce, uh, say first, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I thank you for coming out today um, to hear a story about me. Uh, it was interesting when they presented us with the opportunity to present for AIE. Uh, my business partner and I, we have a podcast, and we interview teachers from all over the country and really all over the world. We've been very privileged and blessed to be able to have some great educational debates with teachers. And when they approached us about this, I, I shared with them, I said, I went to writing and started writing, jot jotting down things and trying to build a presentation around how to express how I came from my experiences of being a sixth grade dropout to being a master teacher now, working on my doctorate. And as I was trying to put it together, he simply said to me, "Say, why are you trying to do that? Just tell your story. You've lived it your entire life. So I just want to start with saying, I am the fourth of five children. I grew up in the inner city in Houston. Um, if you're familiar with the Houston area, uh, Cashmere Gardens, Fifth Ward, right near downtown, uh, the neighborhood wasn't the most desirable. Uh, but we were rich. Um, growing up, you can see I had my mother and my father. Uh, they both passed on to transition. Um, but there were five of us. And you could not tell us that we were poor. We didn't understand the concept of poor. We understood that we had a mom and dad who cared for us. We had food every day that we could eat. And we had the best of what we could afford at that time. So there was no excuse for me and no reason. My, my brothers and sisters, uh, they all, I'll share the story with them when I get to their slide, but we all were in the same mix, brewing in the same pot. I just took a different route. Um, and so when I talk about this, I was thinking about saying, where do I begin? I don't want to take you back all the way to this picture, um, but we'll move and fast forward a little bit sooner. And I want to talk about this next slide, um, because this is when my life changed. Again, as I said, I grew up in the inner city. Uh, my parents were, my dad was a truck driver, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom for the first 10 years of our life. Internet's been a little spotty, but um, she was a stay-at-home mom. So for the first five years of my schooling, my mom was, she was the PTO president. She wasn't everything because my dad allowed, afforded her the opportunity to really parent five of us in the inner city. And... That all changed around 1983, 1984, when my parents divorced. Uh, my dad left. My mom was with us at home, and I quite frankly didn't know how to handle it. Um, just to give you a little backdrop, I'm, my dad and I were born on the exact same day. I'm my dad's namesake. I'm the third, he's the junior. His dad was senior. Um, we shared a bond that you can't really compare because we, we shared that day, that one day that we were uh, born together. But it all changed when they divorced and my dad was removed and now I was left to try to figure out how do I navigate this without the person who I leaned on the most. And there was some turmoil between my mom and I because I wanted to live with my dad and she said no. Um, found out later that it was probably the best deal, best deal for me because my dad was, in, was addicted to alcohol. And that addictive behavior had him doing things that were out of the character of who he was, but he chose it and that's the route that he went. And I can't imagine how my life, this story would be different now had I gone into that environment. But my mom, this is me and my mom, this is around that same time. I remember this Easter like it was yesterday because I remember that shirt. Uh, <laughs> that was one of my favorite shirts because it, I had the gray pants to match it with the red tie with the gray. And I, I felt really good. My mom really liked to dress us up. Even though we didn't have a lot of money, I didn't know then that she was going and getting clothes from Goodwill. She had friends that she worked with that would have kids that were older than us that would pass their clothes down. So I was rocking polos and Levi's and never knew that you could go to the store and buy those. I just knew they came in a big bag that was sitting on my bed. And I went to school and people were like, oh man, you're in polo. Yeah, sure, great. But it wasn't that for me. But it changed when I got to Francis Scott Key Middle School in sixth grade. Ironically, in the sixth grade math class, I put this illustration here, go sit in the corner, Mr. Do Nothing. Because that is the exact words that my sixth grade teacher said to me. Now, I haven't shared this. I, 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 I'm going to I'm I'm try not to get emotional because I'm reliving this with you. And as an educator, I can't fathom telling a kid that your, your, your name is Mr. Do Nothing, even if they did nothing. 
uh, there's power in words, but her words hit me to the core to where I stopped going to class. First it was math class, then it was science class, and then I would show up for band, which was my first period class, and PE, which was my second period class. Then I would hop the fence and I would leave. Then I would hop the fence back at the end of the day as if I'd been to school and walked. Now, my students, I tell this student story to my students, they're like, well, they didn't call home. I say back then, we didn't have the internet like y'all have now, so they were actually writing notes home, and I would intercept the notes from my sister and forge my mom's signature and send them back the next day. So you can imagine my mom's surprise that in May when she gets a call from the counselor finally saying, hey, we need to have you come in to discuss placement for your son for next year because he's gonna have to repeat the sixth grade. Well, what do you mean he's gonna have to repeat the sixth grade? And then it hit her. She had been so busy that she hadn't even stopped to see that she hadn't signed a report card for me. She hadn't signed a progress report. She hadn't seen anything. Now my sisters, straight A students, my brother, President of the choir, basketball star. Me, sixth grade dropout. And I tell my kids, I took it the kind of the back road way to dropping out because I didn't just leave because there were certain parts of school that I really enjoyed. Mr. Turner, my sixth grade band director, telling me I've been playing piano my entire life since I was five years old. And he told me, he said, you know, I want you to learn another instrument that's gonna enhance your piano playing. So of course, I was all ears to listen to everything that he had to say. My PE coach, Coach Head, and uh, Coach Dines, I remember them because they said, hey, you run really fast. We can get you ready to play football for next year. And so those classes I went to, but I don't remember my science teacher. I don't remember my social studies teacher. I remember my math teacher, and I'm, I, I purposely did not share her name because I think that she is a representation of a lot of teachers who get frustrated with students, but they don't know the story. She didn't know that I was going, my parents had just gone through a divorce. She never asked. She didn't ask until we sat in a parent conference at the end of the year with my mom, and my mom said, well, why did you stop going? And the first thing I said was, she called me Mr. Do-Nothing and would make me sit in a corner away from all the other kids, and I just didn't want to be in the class anymore. Well, why didn't you share that with me? And I said, well, I didn't really know how to verbalize the fact that my teacher told me that I'm not going to be anything. Because at home, I would always hear, look in the mirror. Tell yourself, you are somebody that day of the Jesse Jackson saying it, and my mom believed that. She would tell us, look in the mirror, you are somebody, you are somebody. But the power of one teacher superseded all of that goodness that I was getting from my mom and forced me to go into a different situation. But that wasn't the end of the story. My mom moved out of that neighborhood. We moved on. But she made me go back. And I had to go back to those exact same teachers that I dropped off on in sixth grade and face them again. And her words to me were, you never in life allow people to see you fail without a recovery. And that, I tell everyone, my integrity, who I am as a person was crystallized in that moment of having to go back and all of my friends on the seventh grade hall that I've been in school with since elementary school. They're on the seventh grade hall and I'm back in sixth grade looking at these same teachers that I quit on the year before. And that experience gave birth into me that when I got to high school, I remember writing in my memory book that the one thing that I really want, that I really want to do, is to become a, a teacher. Because I knew that I never wanted another kid to feel the way that I felt. So you fast forward to high school, I became the drum major at my high school. Again, that connection with music, that connection that drove me. And everybody was like, oh, he's going to be a great musician. He's going to be great this. He's going to do this. But even then, I would talk with my band director about how do you deal with kids like us? Kids who come in thinking they know it all, but really are lacking so much. Kids that are so resistant. And he would sit and give them the information and share information with me and insight of how he does it. And so, um, and so he would give us that information. The internet spike. So I'm just gonna go with it. Um, so he gave us that information, and then when I got to college, I realized at college I went to Southwest Texas State University, right there in San Marcos. 
uh, where I met my beautiful wife. Um, and when I looked at the history of the school, again, I know that everything happens for a reason, everything's a divine order. It was first founded as a teacher's college. So even though I was not an education major, the, in, the institution itself was designed to create teachers. And so as I went through class after class after class, I kept wondering, why do they keep talking about teaching? Why am I having to take educational psychology and I'm not a psychology major and I'm not an education major? Why am I having to take this? Because that was part of their preparation program. So then, again, I told you I took the long way around. I began working in, with job corps with the Department of Labor. Again, in education, but not in the classroom. Then I started working for Kaplan University as a student services director. Again, in education, not in the classroom. And I kept seeing this backside of what was being created, and I said, how can I be a part of the change on the front end? And that's when I quit my job. Took a job as a substitute teacher. The first day I walked into, they put me on the alternative campus. And I'll never forget the first thing I walked in and I said, I will never do this again. And on my way out, a student said, you can come to be our substitute any day. We like the way you talk to us. I went to a principal and said, hey, can I work at your school? And I came a paraprofessional teacher's aide. And from that moment on, every principal that I had, I went and I talked with them and said, hey, I was a sixth grade dropout. I don't know all the pedagogical terms that you use in, in these classrooms. That wasn't my niche. I don't know. I just know people. In school, I was a sociology major. I knew people. I knew how people worked in groups. I knew how to understand group dynamics. I want to learn this other stuff. Tom Caldwell. Absolutely. Let me get it to you. First principal. Second principal, Janet Ray. Here, sit down and talk with me. Next principal, Dr. Kristen Kraft, you need to be better than a teacher. You need to become a teacher leader. You should push yourself. So I got my master's degree. Christy Van Wassenhove, my last principal that I was served under, she said, there's something about you that people listen to. You need to tell your story. So I joined a doctoral program. Everything that I've done and I've become is because of that teacher who set me in the corner. I didn't realize it then. But she did something to me to create in me something that I didn't know I had, which is the, the act of perseverance. Do you know how to go through what you're going through and get through it? And our students need that. So when I made the decision, I just, this is my first year back in the classroom after three years being an instructional coach. And I, going in so many different classrooms, I kept saying, why are you guys not connecting with your students? Why are you not having conversations with them? Why are you not building relationships with them? Why are they sitting in your room in, in November like it's the first day of school, quiet every time you talk? It's like, well, we're not you. I say, but our kids deserve better. And one of the last slides is not going to let me get to it, but one of the person, people that I really kind of wrapped my whole mind around was uh, Rita Pearson from right here in Houston. And I watched her TED talk. And when she said that every child deserves a champion, an adult in their classroom who believes in them, who focuses their attention not on their faults. My teacher focused on the fact that I put my head down in the classroom. She didn't see that when I put my head down, I was really crying because I knew that I didn't want to go home to my mom and I couldn't go with my dad. She didn't care about that. She didn't care about the fact that at that time, we had moved out of my dad's house and was living with my grandmother and there was eight of us nine of us, including my grandparents, living in a three-bedroom house. She didn't care that we were sleeping on a cot with a pull-out bed underneath and all. She never once asked me, what's going on with you, Wilkie? How much different would I have been if she would have taken that time? And I swore to myself that when I, earned, when I entered this craft, that no teacher, no student under my tutelage would ever be able to walk away from me and say, Mr. Law did this, or I felt like Mr. Law didn't care. My students now, I have students and their parents who follow me on Instagram. And I thought it was funny, one of those students was like, Mr. Law, your Instagram's not private. All the other teachers we find they're private. I said, I have nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. I introduced them to my podcast. Go listen to it. One of my students gave me a report and said, I went and listened to the ones when you first started teaching us, because I wanted to hear what you were saying about us. <laughs> Everything you said was right, and we thank you for it. Again, full transparency with my students, full transparency because of what I've been through. We don't know what our kids bring into the classroom. We don't know the struggles that they face. When a kid comes in my room and they have their head down, I don't even say, put your head up. I walk over and say, hey, do you need a moment? 
Do you need to step outside? Maybe you need a drink of water? Do, is there something you need to talk about? I'll stop a math lesson to teach a life lesson. Because I tell them life lessons last long. The world doesn't care if you can conjugate a verb. Employers do, but the world doesn't. The world doesn't care if you know two times two, two plus two. They don't care about that. We have calculators for that now. They care, do you care? And if we can show students as educators that we care, we're not just here for a paycheck. We're not just here so we can get summers off. We're not just here to have the weekends. We're here because we care. And when we impart that into our kids, they'll then impart themselves into us. And as they bring us them, we can then start showing them and revealing those layers of who they are to make them better productive. No student should ever feel like that picture. No student should ever feel and walk away saying, uh, I might as well give up. The difference between me and my students now is my mom. My mom was a true soldier. She was a warrior. She was a battle. She fought cancer. And I often say that sometimes that she, she fought cancer the way she did because of us. We were her motivational force because she knew I have to fight every day to make sure that I give you just enough to make sure that you can function and be productive and thrive in the world. What are we giving our kids? Let your experience that you've gone through. My partner and I talk all the time. He says, I realize that my, my experience is so different from my kids, but still share it with them. Your experience may, the fact that you grew up in a home with both your parents, not to brag, but it may be inspirational to them to say, you know what, well maybe every situation doesn't have to look like mine. Maybe I can change what I've done. Maybe I can do something better. And that's our goal as educators. So I want to thank you for taking time to listen to my talk. And I apologize for the technological issues with that. So.